assure a future for local journalism that is both socially responsible and economically sustainable. This economic sustainability is something we're going to be hearing about a lot more in the next 45 minutes. Well, get ready to hear some interesting answers to those questions from people working on the front lines of local journalism around the world. Our next panel, this Global Media Forum panel, brings together local journalists from local journalism professionals from Argentina, Bangladesh, Germany, India, and Nigeria. Some of them work in traditional media, newspapers. Some of them work in other forms of media. They are blazing new trails of innovation that we've already heard quite a bit about today. Artificial intelligence is a good transition into that topic. You're going to meet some of them right after this scene-setting video. Shifting Powers, the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, your laboratory for the digital age. Falling revenues, diminishing relevance, and little hope for recovery. Local newspapers and radio stations suffer. Many have gone out of business. Others have been taken over and stripped to the bare bones by new owners. But the need remains for local outlets to deliver information. So, what can be done to revive local news organizations? How can media professionals strengthen local papers and broadcasters against the current backdrop? Join our discussion, The Future of Local Journalism. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, okay, now is my turn. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome the panelists that I gave you a, an idea about earlier. I'll int introduce them each individually right now, and then I'm going to let them explain just a little bit about what they do, because we not only have four journalists from four different parts of the world, here on our panel, they also work in different forms of media when we're talking about local journalism. So it's a very diverse panel in that respect. Um, I'll start uh, from, from my left here and move across. Uh, Chani Guyo is CEO of the Argentinian news startup Redacción. He's the former editor-in-chief of La Nación, that's Argentina's leading conservative newspaper. So we want to hear why you made that transition. Anna Minj is chair of the Bangladesh Community Radio Association, uh, which is serving local people in rural areas. She's also the director of community empowerment and a number of other things at BRAC, or BRAC, which is uh, in Bangladesh, which is the world's largest NGO, I understand. It's also a great pleasure to have with us today Sa Ibrahim, Managing Director of the Abu Bakr Rimi Television in Kanu State in Nigeria. She's been a journalist for over 30 years and her career has taken her around the world. And on my far right here, Michael Bruckner is the Editor-in-Chief of the Rheinische Post. That's an influential regional daily newspaper that's in Dusseldorf here in Germany. So we've got a startup on right there. We've got uh, a community radio program here. We've got television here, and we've got a newspaper there from different parts of the world. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. Um, let's start, if we can, just where each of you just describe what it is you do, because in some cases it's very, very specific and very different from what we might be used to. Uh, starting with you, Chani. Thank you, Terry. Um, Redaction is um, an antidote to news intoxication. We publish seven newsletters, some daily, some weekly, to address the noise created by the overabundance of news. And on the other hand, our regional reporting use uh, some of the uh, constructed news or solution journalism techniques um, to, to explain what's happening, to tell the stories of the people that are addressing challenges on social issues like health, education, gender, or um, sustainability, and always trying to incorporate uh, audience participation all along the process of, of our journalism. Anna? Uh, thank you. A um, uh, little bit, uh, community radio in Bangladesh is comparatively new. It started in 2011, and at the moment there are 18 community radios who are airing their programs and other uh, 17 are in the process. 
And in 2014, we also formed this Bangladesh Community Radio Association, which I am chairing. And this is for uh, actually a coordinating a platform for the radio initiators for promote uh, and develop and capacity building of uh, community radios in Bangladesh uh, with principle of solidarity and, and social transformation. Okay, so? Well, it's I, Ibrahim is my name once again, and um, I had the television station, which is a public broadcast station in Kano, northern Nigeria. And it's a television station that caters for the needs of the local environment, doing about 60 programs a week, uh, taking into consideration the religious and other social life and family life of the local communities. Mika. Yeah, thank you, Terry, for having me. I'm Michael Brocker from Düsseldorf, which is a town right across the river. You just have to pass this tiny little cologne in between. And <laughs> I'm editor-in-chief. No rivalry there, no. Of a, but the rivalry is a good point, but anyway. Uh, we have 230 editors in 28 local editions from Düsseldorf and North to the Netherlands border. And yeah, we are facing all the challenges everybody else is facing. And I tell you, to get a regional, traditional regional newspaper in a digitally transformed way, it's not an easy thing to do. Great. So we have, in a nutshell, basically what, what the panelists are involved in, what they're doing. What we're going to spend the next half hour or so doing is looking at the challenges that you face individually, where you see the future evolving for your particular medium and your particular area, and, and of course, the, the paper or the television station or the community radio association or the startup that you're involved in. Let's, let's start with you, Chani, because what I find interesting about your biography is that you were the editor-in-chief of the, one of the largest newspapers in Argentina, very successful, and you left it. You just walked away from what for many would be a dream job, to start something that many might regard extremely risky. Uh, what, tell us what led you to do that. Well, a very interesting question. The short answer is I believe that our industry needs a lot of experimentation. Uh, needs the, the next 10 years would be most, more disruptive than the last 10 years for our industry. That's what I am assuming. So um, I'm in the best place to try new things and experiment. So we think of Redaction really as a as a um, space where we try to do different things. We are learning a lot and we are experimenting in terms of formats, in terms of how to uh, address the participation um, era. And, and that's what is happening in audiences today. Argentina is a big place. Uh, you're dealing with local journalism in it. You're taking a completely different approach from what many people might be uh, accustomed to. How does that serve local audiences? Well, we are based in Buenos Aires. It's a very big city, 3 million people, or 12 if you consider the, the whole region. Uh, but we do really focus on people's lives and organizations that are doing something for society. So um, on that sense, you can do local from almost everywhere. We, we travel through the country and, and tell those stories from the community perspective, trying to... Uh, explain and trying to have empathy for those stories so that our audience can interact, as I would say, almost directly with those stories. You were at La Nación, a very established n newspaper. It's been around... I, I 150 years next January. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a very traditional, very successful paper. Uh, do you think that paper, when you left it, did you think... Mm, I'm seeing the writing on the wall, newspapers are struggling, so I better jump into the digital pool? No, not at all. Um, newspapers are struggling, but I'm quite sure that in this case, for example, in Asion, they, they, they have like the, the tools and the mindset to uh, travel this tsunami. But of course, you have to choose uh, which ship you are on, and which is the, the, your main 
a daily challenge. Uh, so uh, I've been the editor in chief for five years, um, and I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. But of course, creating a startup from zero, we are only one year old. Um, it's it's another kind of challenge, probably as challenging as transforming uh, traditional media. What does Redacion offer local audiences that other forms of of media cannot? We take a deep look to local conversations, to what people are talking about, trying to highlight and select underreported stories. Um, a big part of big media are talking with politicians about politics. And many times, uh, a part of the audience is left behind. Uh, the two uh, groups in, in every research, the two groups of audience that are getting bigger is news fatigue and news avoidance. Those are the people we are trying to, to connect because uh, they are having less uh, journalism and less quality journalism. And, and behind that challenge, there is a, an, an important civic and social commitment on how that, but the challenges we assume as a society needs not just the leaders and the ideas, but also civic and social participation. So that's the aim of Redaction. Social participation, getting communities involved. Uh, this sounds a lot like what maybe you are trying to do, Anna, with, with community radio in Bangladesh. Uh, do you see some parallels there? Is that what you're doing too? How do you serve that need for local journalism and the need that we just heard uh, described? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, especially in our country context, as I have mentioned, that uh, community radio movement is comparatively new here. And this was done because uh, in the rural area, access is uh, still an issue because there are uh, people, those who are living in difficult areas, communication is not easy, and also the electricity supply, including the internet access, is an issue. So, uh, actually, to ensure uh, accessibility and also to raise the voice of the local community, these community radio initiatives are started. And I think the way at the moment we are working, we are actually serving the need of the very rural poor, especially women, uh, because they do not have much access to the mainstreaming uh, media because of the language barrier, because of the other barriers. So most of the community radios, they broadcast their programs in local dialects, who is very, which is very uh, convenient for the uh, local rural poor, especially those who are illiterate and especially women, those who uh, stay in the home. So it's actually serving the need of the very excluded people in the community. Now that sounds very close, uh, if I may say, to an example that we also want to uh, show our audiences. We have a video of an example of good practice journalism dealing with local journalism, in this case from India. Let's uh, hope we can get that played. I would like to have it right now, if possible. We'll pick up. When we come back. Communication through dance is vital in this part of India. CG Netswara uses the opportunity to tell people how they can report local news just by making a phone call. We do not have any communication platform in their language and on voice because they are mostly illiterate people. They don't know how to read and write. So what we have done here, we have created what we call voice book. So they pick up their phone and they tell their stories. The tribal area in central India is affected by violence and poverty. Millions of people here also lack the usual reach of mainstream media. CG Netswara is empowering them and getting their voices heard. So it is bringing hope back. The problem was people were hopeless, they were picking up guns, but now these positive stories, these stories of hope 
are spreading that okay my problem has not got solved but somebody else's has so maybe my problem will also get solved so it is improving democracy And it's our great pleasure to have with us here today Shubrancho Chudari. He's the gentleman that you saw in that video right there. He's come all the way from India to share with us some of his insights and uh, hopefully give us some idea of what others in this room might be able to take back home and apply with respect to local journalism. First of all, thank you so much for, for coming to join us here today. And if, if you don't mind, would, could you stand up, please? Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Shubran, uh, tell us a little more about what you do and how it works and why you started it. So as we are talking of shifting powers, uh, earlier the power was with kings and queens. Now in India, we just voted. Everybody voted to make or choose our new king. So everybody can vote. Similarly, can everybody report their stories? Will that be a better system? So last century was the century for democratization of politics. But communication makes communities. If our communication remains aristocratic as it is, it is one way, top down, controlled by small number of people, it's very difficult to create a democratic politics. We have all the tools. What we are trying here, uh, in India, we talk about caste. So we have three types of caste in communication world. Some who have internet, around half of the world is on internet. Some who have phone, and some who don't have phone. Can we create a platform? So we need social media, but it needs to be social, so it's inclusive. We shouldn't stop at internet. We need to go to phone world, so hear voices. We also need to go to the world where there is no phone, so you use Bluetooth. The radio, what you just saw, they call it Bultu radio. They can't pronounce Bluetooth, so <laughs> it has become Bultu radio. And the second most important thing is, if it is media, it needs to be responsible. What we have created in the name of social media is a marketplace where anybody can say anything and rich and powerful will always misuse it. So we are flooded with fake news. So we need to create systems. We have created election commission. So 1.3 billion people speak and it takes a few months, but we get an answer. In the same way, can we create news commission where everybody tells their stories and it is cross-checked and verified by probably elected journalists. So if I do my work well, mm. I will get re-elected. Mm. Mm. So we need to think and create a better form of communication that can be democratic. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm going to th thank you so much, uh, but I have one more question before we go because this this question I'm about to put to you is a question I'm going to put to everyone on this panel, and that is about how do you, how does it, how do you pay for it? Where, how, what is the funding? How do you sustain yourself economically? It sounds like you're doing very much responsible quality journalism uh, at, on a local level, very localized, empowering people. But is it a nonprofit? How does it work? How do, how do you finance yourself? Thank you, Terry, for asking that. I have not done it but that's what I want to do it. And it's for all of us. So we have a model of journalism, the top-down journalism. We need to find a sustainable and economic model for bottom-up representative democratic media. So if it is a communication platform, which we use for communication, it can also be used for buying and selling. So I have something in a remote village where there is no phone even, which can be useful to you in Germany. Now we are connecting two worlds, two unconnected worlds. But I the, have the, a herb. Excuse me for, for, for interrupting, but um, I, 
it is my journalistic instinct. Uh, often we don't have an, even as much time as we have now in a compressed atmosphere, but how, how are you financed? Where does the money come from? That's through this I'm barter? Through That's this where I'm coming to. Okay. So if this transaction creates a profit, part of that profit can run the communication platform. And it, and it does support your platform and, for example, you, or are not, you volunteering your time? Not at the moment, but that's where we want to go. We are working on it from last 15 years to create a platform. We now work, want to work on it to create a sustainable platform. Okay, okay. great. So can you create this platform which also makes profit for the people who are reporters? They can also be supplier for something which is needed for people like us who have more money. So when this cash exchange creates a profit, can part of that profit makes this democratic platform mm. also independent and sustainable. That will be the model for when all these small okay. community platforms get connected and create a Times of Real India rather than Very good. what we have today. Shubranshu, thank you so much for sharing that with us today. And uh, just, just to make sure, I've not forgotten about you two over here. I'm going, going to be getting over here in just a moment, but because this is so relevant, I think, to what uh, we've already heard about from Anna a little bit, do you see some parallels there, Anna, to what you're doing in Bangladesh? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, what he said, we are also trying to make it relevant for the rural community, especially for the women. And as the question you have raised uh, regarding uh, financial sustainability, uh, in our case also, these are the uh, initiated by national and local development organizations. So at the moment, uh, they are financing so not very uh, resource, particularly financial resources are available for uh, managing the community radios. And uh, also, uh, our, as per our policy, maximum 10% year time we can advertise uh, for earning money. So this is very insignificant. This is one hand, and in other hand, uh, our uh, rural economy is also not very strong to contribute in the community uh, radios. And as per our community radio policy in the country, uh, they're supposed to set up a trust fund, but that yet to be uh, set up. So at the moment, the community radios are really facing challenges in regarding financial sustainability. But uh, as we have formed this uh, Bangladesh Community Radio Association, through this association, we are coming together and helping each other so that uh, programs we can develop, uh, one organization can develop program, they can share, so other do not need to develop the similar kind of program. So, and also for uh, broadcasting different kind of campaigns, advocacy, sometimes we are joining hands together. So maybe one organization is uh, uh, taking time uh, or investing to develop that program, then we are sharing it to, to actually reach out the uh, maximum population. So that way we are managing but it is an issue. Okay, uh, yeah. just um, because the funding question does become ultimately so important for uh, economic sustainability, you have to somehow have the funding or you cannot afford to maintain quality journalism. It, quality journalism costs money, as we've all learned, and we're hoping that people won't always expect to get it for free. This is a, one of the challenges that we're facing. I'm just curious, do you see a future for your community radio association uh, beyond relying on development trusts? Yeah, I, I think that as uh, we are helping each other, particularly uh, how we can help each other to strengthen our capacity, so we are uh, actually uh, collaborating to each other and wherever we are uh, actually, and also very recently, we registered this uh, platform 
so that we can actually help each other uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, resources. So jointly we can apply for any kind of resources. Not only that, uh, we are doing advocacy to the government mechanism so that this uh, trust fund is set up. So from there also we can actually access this uh, funding to manage and run the community radio. Okay, so you yeah. see a future for it, and that's a, that's a very encouraging note at this point, uh, which also offers a, a good transition to Michael Bruckner, who is still working in, still, I say, uh, advisedly, still working in print media, uh, despite all of the doomsayers uh, who say that print doesn't have a future. Uh, we, all, we heard that a little bit from this morning from Matthias Dockner, who was saying that, well, print, you know, he's not fixated on print either. It's uh, if you have to go digital, then you go digital. I wanted to ask you, Michael Bruckner, you mentioned that you have many different, very specific uh, community localized versions of your editions of your paper, the Rheinische Post but you're continuing to thrive. I looked at your publication figures. You, they've been going down a bit, a little bit every year, but you still have a significant, uh, I think, a readership of around, I don't know, you sell around 300,000 papers uh, uh, regularly. What future do you see for you, you as a regional paper? And how, how important is digital in that mix? Print is still some part of the future, so I wouldn't be that skeptical. Matthias Döpfner is, is sometimes too digital in his in his statements. I think because we see a we see a print um, readership who is actually, especially in the little villages down there on the Niederrhein, and or in the Rhineland Valley where we are right now, who are still relying on their paper every morning. Well, that doesn't mean you you can't shift your strategy into new digital innovative um, elements and that's what we have to do i mean the, our our usp is the local community we are the ones who know everything about this place we know much about Kleve or more about Kleve or Düsseldorf or Mönchengladbach than let's say google or facebook because we can connect what happens there to what happened before and why is this politician saying this his party did do something else two year, two, 10 years ago. So we have to build a community of knowledge in our local editions. And this is not only print. This can be events, this can be newsletters, that can be podcasts, this can be a partnership between the editors and the readers to uh, empower them, like he said, to be part of the future development in the city. And that's the print is one way to do this, but it's not the only way. So if we invest technology, personal, and finance back into local journalism, I see a bright future ahead. So it's not really a question of whether you have uh, words printed on a piece of paper or whether they appear as pixels on your screen. You're talking about offering quality journalism, quality content from journalists who have uh, an understanding of the context and have, have a history of knowing what they're talking about and have become uh, to the point, have gotten to the point where people rely on them and know that it's quality information. But still, at the end of the day, however you are selling your content, you have to sell it. It's a, it's sure. a commercial venture. Uh, do you, and, and many people today, we heard earlier that 70% of uh, people in India, this is from a, uh, the session this morning, 70% of people get their news from Facebook and from Google. Uh, so the sure. question to, to me is, how can you assure in the digital age that people are going to continue to be willing to pay for your product and not expect to get it free? I see a broad development throughout the whole media, national and regional, uh, putting uh, content behind paywalls and do it s slightly uh, successful. Um, everybody knows out there, if you want to have quality deep down journalism and let's say research for a month and then one story, you have to pay for that. That costs money, there's a value to it and I think the people more or less get to used to it. If that's enough for what we have on costs right now, that's a different question. But I see the readers are more or less um, paying for journalism content. And if, if we do it broad on a 360 degree basis, we might get even more of that. Let's see our podcast or our daily podcast, which is just a short news on our uh, regional um, uh, stories. They, it has 40,000 readers, uh, not readers, uh, listeners. 
And we didn't have them before. We have new sponsors who never put an ad into our paper who want to sponsor this podcast. So we see a slightly, of course, little figures, but still good development of new digital innovative um, supplies to the readers and listeners, which we didn't have before. So if we stick to it, and that's what I'm saying, we can't cut costs on the local journalism, but then say on Sundays here at a news conference, local journalism is the future of journalism, then we have to invest in it and see if we can uh, change maybe the figures in the next couple of years. But we really have to do consistently deep down journalism in the local state as well as the national. You know, we put the money in our Berlin uh, bureaus, uh, we put money in our, in our big events with, with high top level politicians, put the money down there where our readers really are, and that's the local business. And if, if, if that's going to be the strategy, I think we will have some more success than we think. If it's not only print, of course, you know, shift the strategy from print to all the funny, exciting, new digital innovative elements which are out there. What do you see then as the main challenges facing your industry and facing the Rheinische Post specifically? The, the main challenge are the people. I mean, you have to do the, the change in the, in the heads of the editors. They really have to get down to the curiosity which they once had when they got into that profession. You know, in, in our um, interviews at the beginning, they all say, yeah, I'm curious about people and stories and I want to find them. And after 10, 12, 15 years, maybe sometimes after the three or four years, you see they're in some kind of a routine. Do I really have to call up this guy? I don't know him. Let, let me call this one who I always talk to. And this is, and do I really have to do a podcast? Why do I have to do a newsletter now? I'm, I still have three or four print pages to fill. And if you don't really eager to get to know to the new digital journalism world, it's not the right place for you. And the change in the heads of the people is, is the main challenge for us in the business. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've, we've got an example of a startup from someone who left traditional newspaper and, and started Redacción in Argentina and is working in, in very interesting, innovative ways. I know you also have a, a news laboratory that you uh, develop for, for people as well. We've heard examples of community empowerment through community radio, both in Bangladesh and in India, relying on different technologies, trying to harness the power there. We've heard from a traditional newspaper that is holding on and continuing to maintain its relevance in, in a very difficult environment, I would say. We're now going to hear an example from Nigeria about television. Uh, Sa Ibrahim, the, if I've understood what your television station is about, um, Abu Bakr Rimi TV, it is, it is state funded, is that correct? Yes, sir. And it's, it's, in a, it's in an important state in Nigeria. I think it might be its most populous state. There are yes. around 10 million people in this state alone, which is bigger than many European countries, it must be said. Um, when you do local journalism, I mean, what is local journalism in that context? It must be a, it must be a huge challenge dealing with the multiple audiences that you have in that state, in Kanu State. Yes, um, it is, but uh, it is a lot easier because in northern Nigeria, we speak the same language and um, in That's Hausa, Kanu, is it? Yes, yeah. that is Hausa. And also in Kano, 99% um, of the people are Muslim communities. So you are doing program uh, for one set of people. But again, there is that, even if it is that 1%, that you have to cater for uh, their needs also. So it makes it a lot easier for us to move even with the um, population but uh, for us, uh, we, we, we have to go deep down to the local communities because they are very poor and living in um, rural areas that to them, uh, the social media does not mean much to them. Uh, therefore, for us in the broadcast industry, the, the uh, local uh, broadcast industry, we pay very little attention to that. We see it as a challenge, but uh, not so much as a negative challenge, but just to bring out the best in us. We have to go deep down, talk to the local people, provide these services for them. They rely on us to talk to the government on their behalf. 
and uh, we, they rely on us to develop programs, uh, light entertainment programs, so that they could move with time to, uh, to, to know their culture. And uh, in that respect, we, we deal with the challenge of continuing to provide these services under a very uh, difficult situation financially. But, uh, Even though you're state-funded, you're, you're dealing with a difficult financial situation. Yes, so the government because, isn't providing you. The government funds provides money. the salaries of the workers, but uh, the running costs. You, as the head of the station, you must find a way around dealing with the running costs of the station, which sometimes may be huge, even uh, higher than the salaries the government pays for you, because you have to provide services to the rural areas. You have to have vehicles to go there. You have to conduct town hall meetings in order to get their views because you can't sit in the comfort of your offices and develop programs for these people. You have to go right down into the communities, sit with them, uh, ask them to assess what you have given them, maybe you know, on a quarterly basis, and then yeah, uh, you take new ideas and come back to develop programs. So it's a round cycle that you can't mm. afford to lose touch with the local communities. This is like we keep hearing this point. You can't afford to lose touch with the local communities. Yeah. Going out into the communities, hearing what people have to say, and what you were describing, acting as a mediator, and we've heard this a, a number of times, also speaking truth to power, as it were, to get the voice of the people and to articulate that voice uh, to the powers that be. This going out into the community is something that we have another example of uh, from a gentleman who is with the Mercurist. You're going to hear from him in just a moment. I'm we have a video that's prepared that's going to show you another way of getting out and getting community input in ways that uh, are changing the way local journalism is done. <laughs> The editorial board of Mercurist in the German city of Mainz is having its weekly meeting. The team is discussing a story idea submitted by a user. She took pictures of public places in Mainz littered with cigarette butts and wants to know why the local government is doing nothing about it. The journalistic concept is uh, basically it's community driven. Let's hear the voice of our readers and then make a decision if we want to put more work into it or not. At Mercurist, story ideas by users are called SNPs. Registered users can create SNPs within the Mercurist app. Other users can add pictures and facts, and they can also click on the so-called OHA button to show their interest. If a story idea gets many OHAs, an article is commissioned. I think in Mainz we get perhaps five or ten SNPs a day, so 30 a week or something like that. In Wiesbaden and Frankfurt, it should be the same. And that is 50% of the content on our page. While many local news outlets are struggling to survive in Germany, Merkurist is growing. It has nearly 30,000 registered users and reaches 1.5 million people every month. We have a solution and we have a radical way of thinking local journalism differently. Um, we've shown that it works. In the meantime, the story idea about cigarette butts has accumulated enough or has. The editorial board has decided to run an article on it. A radical new way of doing journalism. You saw Manuel Conrad there, the guy who created the Mercurist. He's with us today as well. He didn't have quite as far to go as Shubranshu, but uh, we're also just as happy to have him here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Manuel Conrad. Manuel, tell us what it is <laughs> that drove you to do this, because I know, looking at your biography, I see that you come from a business background. You worked for a large consultancy. Uh, you didn't necessarily come straight out of journalism. You came more out of, out of business. So is this a business venture? Is, do you see this as the future of commercial local journalism? Um, absolutely. Um, well, I'm a business guy. I'm not a journalist. Um, that also is what a lot of critics uh, complain about me. 
Um, but I see that local journalism is uh, in big trouble and, and we need uh, yeah, new ways of thinking and I think Mercuris is one approach of doing so. And how, do you, how does it pay for itself? Well, obviously um, we are uh, financed by venture capital and uh, our main driver is that we think we need to build a strong community. So we have to see the, the reader of our news just as a consumer at the end, but try to integrate them into our process as soon as possible by um, participating topics because um, most of our readers, they, they are closer to the topics than our editors. They are, they are faster and we try to use that resources. Also, we try to get away from the point um, yeah, what editors do think is relevant and important. We try to delegate that also to our readers because in the end we want to do a product which serves them. And uh, it's, a, it's a hybrid approach and um, it works very well in, in minds. And currently we are financing us um, by advertorial uh, revenues. So we go to local enterprises and try to sell our ad products, but we also think that this could be the foundation of a, yeah, a subscription model, because when you have a, a strong community where you are more than just a, for which you are more than just a news outlet, um, you, you have a bigger, better foundation to convince them to pay for your journalistic pieces. Not for all of them, but for the, the, the high quality ones. Fascinating. Thank you so much, uh, Manuel. Unfortunately, we're running a little tight on time. The clock tells me we really only have a minute left. I hope that's not true. Um, do we have until... We have until five, don't we? Yes. Okay. This is good. So we still have a few more minutes. Um, uh, hearing what of this example of the Mercurist, and there are several different editions of this, I believe, serving different communities. Um, I'm just wondering how that rings in your ears, uh, Chani Guyo. This, uh, does, that, does that sound like a plausible business plan to you as a journalist? Well, we are for profit. Uh, we don't run ads. We don't want to play the, the page views game and the volume game. But we do have sponsors on our newsletters, and that's doing very good. And on the other hand, we do have, a, a, and we are launching a membership program. Um, and the, the most you've got, if you're a member, uh, is participation opportunities, more participation opportunities. But absolutely, it's a beautiful example of how to integrate uh, this sort of, of n knowledge of the crowd in, in, in the journalism operation. Okay, well, um, Ma Michael, when you hear this uh, as the editor-in-chief of of a, of a successful and influential uh, regional newspaper. Rheinische Post is an institution also in Germany. It's been around for, uh, for a long, long time. What, do you feel threatened by this? Not at all. I is like it the, something, a direction that you sure. might be going in? I, I like the approach because uh, they are not only talking about uh, getting the readers into the newsroom, taking the readers seriously, they're actually doing it. They're doing it. And uh, finally, as I understood, um, the editor if, if you have the 100% OHA rate, you have to do the piece, right? But if you have like the 50 or 60%, it's just a good source and to see if there's a story. And we didn't do it that sophisticated, but we have a, a technology-based listening center implemented in our newsroom, which covers 40 million sources um, a day a pro, um, according to our buzzwords, which we implemented into the software. So, so we get a feedback channel from social media, and then we decide is that a story or not. If it gets a lot of attention in the, in the web, it should, it's obviously something that people talk about. So why shouldn't we take a deeper look? And of course, this kind of disrupts the editor's minds, only what I think is relevant. But, you know, this is 80s thinking. We are past this. So technologies, or go ahead, you want to... Oh, in a sense, I think that addresses uh, one of the most difficult mindset change that we need as an industry, and that is the, the, the broadcast and download approach to journalism. Uh, we used to know everything and to have all the power. That have already changed. The, the, the question is, how do we interpret that change and how do we incorporate uh, the reader's opinion or ideas in our editorial process?
Is there a paper version of what you do? We do have a, a very particular paper magazine once a month for members. It's an unfolded, it's very particular. And we said that we delivered around 15 or 20 minutes of visual and intellectual pleasure. It's very well written, it's beautifully designed, just like a, a very double spread broadsheet uh, folded mm. and each part uh, creates its own space of, of journalism. And it's, it's more of stories and visual journalism. Now, I, I want to bring in both of you with examples from from places where you're dealing with a completely different set of circumstances, uh, particularly in Bangladesh. It's a, it's a developing country. It's sort of the global south, if you will, uh, that faces many, many big challenges economically. But you're using technology to interact. And we keep hearing this again and again, getting feedback from the local communities using the technologies that are available. What role do you see these technologies playing in the future in a country like Bangladesh for local journalism? Yeah, uh, definitely technology has uh, a big role to play, uh, especially in the um, current model. Uh, what we do, though we broadcast different kind of uh, development agenda, uh, starting from awareness raising to dissemination of information. At the same time, we actually, by using technology, we get feedback. Like uh, uh, the, the listeners, they provide feedback through SMS, sometimes from phone call. So that are the mechanism we are using. And also, nowadays, we are actually, after broadcasting some certain informations, we have the Facebook pages. So we are actually uploading those things there. Apart from that, uh, the uh, under community radio mechanism, we have a listeners club at the uh, grassroots level so that uh, after airing different programs, our people go back and listen their feedback or uh, what is their voice or what do they want to hear in the community radio. So that kind of mechanism is taking place, but I see definitely there is a huge possibility of uh, utilizing the technologies. So interactivity, it turns out to be absolutely crucial when you're dealing with local journalism. I think we all know that intuitively. You have to be close to the audiences that you serve. Uh, that is easily enough done perhaps for uh, for print or online or for radio to some degree dealing with the, the challenges of a, of a developing country where some people may not have access to electricity, uh, much less uh, the internet. Television, is, it's, it's expensive. I mean, you know, we know this. Uh, Deutsche Welle works, of course, online. We have radio, but I work in, in the television and I have worked in television and radio most of my life. How do, you, how do you see these technologies supporting your mission uh, beyond simply linear broadcasting? Yeah, uh, you see, when we are talking about uh, the happenings in the uh, journalism profession, we need to know that there are a large number of people who do not have access to electricity, who do not have access to data, they cannot afford it, uh, so you need to find a way around uh, uh, getting to these people. Even for us in television, we had to devise a channel, which is an audio channel, but running concurrently with the television station in order to reach the local communities. Therefore, we need to pay attention to the fact that, uh, yes, we need to accept that social media is there, but until we have cheaper cheaper uh, data to, to, do, to, to deal with, until we have access to internet, until we have access to electricity, I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, local uh, broadcasting will continue to be relevant. It depends on the community, but for us, dealing with the local communities, we are still relevant, and I think uh, we still have a long way uh, before we, we run into any problems. But I accept the fact that we should complement each other. We should accept new ways of doing things and we find a way to converge. 
so that inter, uh, the local uh, broadcasting and the social media and other platforms that we have, we need to find a way that we can work together. Walking together, a great way to end this session on the future of local journalism, convergence. Uh, we're all going to converge uh, this evening, I hope, next door where we're, we've got a, a reception uh, prepared. But uh, right now, I'm told that we have a, a break. And when we come back in about 15 minutes from now, we're going to hear a session on the future of artificial intelligence. Guido will be back. I don't know if Sophia will be joining us. Oh, look, she tilts her head and grins. I feel more and more threatened by that. Have, I don't know if any of you have seen this uh, newsreader that was presented. Uh, the, the Chinese are working on it. It's most impressive, a little bit scary. I hope I'll be retired by the time they get all of the kinks out of that. But anyway, thank you very much for being here. A warm round of applause for all of our speakers. And do be back in 15 minutes for Guido and Artificial Intelligence. Thanks.